How do you build an African-American tree? Do you descend through formerly enslaved individuals or do you not know? Do you think that it's impossible for you to build a family tree if you are African-American? So many people of African-American heritage feel like there is nothing that they can do. They don't know where to begin to build a tree and you can. You can build a tree. You can learn more about your ancestors. It is not impossible. Now, African-American genealogy is the toughest. And when you're a good African-American genealogist, you're a good genealogist, period. So a lot of the tips that I'm gonna be giving you today really honestly can pertain to a lot of types of genealogy, but some pertain exactly to those that descend from enslaved individuals. So I want you to be successful in building your tree. I want you to feel like, yes, I can do this. I'm gonna give you the first steps today that you need in order to build your tree, in order to discover your African-American heritage here in the United States. Who were the enslavers of your ancestors? What are their stories? These amazing men and women, how did they create lives for you after they were freed? There's so much to learn about your family and I don't want you to think you can't do it. You can. So. First steps today, gotta happen. I'm gonna teach you how to go about finding your family and we're gonna begin your research and you're gonna be excited because you can do this, I promise. I'm Amy Cross and I'm here to help you find your ancestors. Stick with me if you want to make the most of your family history, let's take your genealogy to the next level. So first off, I need to kind of give you some caveats. I'm white. I, to my knowledge, do not descend through African Americans, but I have had a lot of clients that do. And I've worked on African American projects for quite a while. And it's a passion of mine. It's something that I really want to help people find their family. And for people that are African American, it can be really difficult. So it's something that I've been doing for a while. I've taken a number of classes and, and coursework in order to learn better skills because you need them. Um, I actually want to send a thanks out to Ari Wilkins. She's at the Dallas Central Library on the genealogy floor, and she teaches at a lot of classes. She's a good friend of mine. She is amazing. If you have the opportunity to take a class from her, do so. She helped me kind of go through this video and make sure that I wasn't missing something important. So thank you for that. Um, now, back to the caveats. Because I'm not black, because I don't know the experiences of somebody that's African American, I am honestly very concerned that I'm going to say something here that may be offensive to somebody. Please understand my intent is only of the best. I want you to find your family, and if I say anything that is maybe the, not the best, best way to word something, please forgive me. I can claim my third great uncle was a member of the Underground Railroad, and I'm so grateful for that heritage. Um, my great, third great grandfather had moved to the same community as he lived, so I can only hope that he helped and that he was aware and that he was part of this, but I don't know that for sure. Sometimes in the context of the video, I'm going to use the word slave. For instance, in the federal slave schedules, that's what they're called. And I want you to be able to find them. So I'm going to use words that pertain to research in this period. And you're gonna to wanna to be aware of a lot of those words because they're going to help you find record groups like slave or slavery, freed people of color, freedmen, black or Negro. Those are words that are going to be in a lot of the records that you're going to be looking at. And you need to be prepared to search for those words because that's how you're going to find the things that you need. Before we dive in, I do want to let you know that there is a handout for this video. The handout's going to go into a little bit more depth on some of these things and outline everything that I've said, as well as provide you some links to important sites that I can't show you in the video. So you might want to check that out. You can either join Amy's crew as part of the YouTube channel. You can join the channel or you can look in the video description below and you can go to my Etsy page and you can purchase the handout there. So check that out in the video description below. So let's dive in. First steps. The first thing you need to do is work your way backward. You need to start with what you absolutely know. And I'm not talking about family lore here because sometimes the way we talk about things in our family, names get confused, things aren't right. You want to use solid genealogical practices here. You can check out my Genealogy 101 playlist if you'd like. I'm gonna put the link for that in the video description below. But you wanna make sure that you're proving things as you go. Because if you're spending a ton of time 
in during the Civil War looking at your enslaved ancestors and their possible enslavers, and you have the wrong family, it's not going to do you any good. So you're going to work your way back with census records beginning in the 1950 census and working back every 10 years. Now, there wasn't a census in 1890. Well, there was, but it was destroyed for the most part, almost everywhere. There's a couple that exist, but for the most part, you won't find 1890. But you want to work your way backwards. And then not only that, that family that you're watching and that you're moving backwards, I want you to find some other records that help prove that this is indeed your family. Things like World War I or World War II draft cards, vital records, things like that. Again, check out that Genealogy 101 playlist if you need help with this step. So you're working your way backwards to 1870 because that is going to be the first census that you're going to find your enslaved ancestors. If your ancestors were free, they will show up in earlier census records. But in, for the most part, in this video, we're going to be directing to those people that have enslaved ancestors, okay? All right, step number two, you need to find your family in that 1870 census. It's really important. That 1870 census is kind of the key to determine determining more about your family. And you want to compare your family in 1870 with the family in 1880. And the reason that I say that is because in 1870, this is not long after the Civil War had ended. And a lot of times people that were enumerated together may not necessarily be related. Sometimes they were just residing together because they had all been on the same plantation or farm together. And the census in 1870 didn't ask for relationships to the head of the house, the first person listed in the census. But the 1880 census did. Now, sometimes those relationship information isn't completely correct and, and it can be wrong, but it gives you a really good idea. So you want to be comparing those people that you find in 1870 with the people that you found in 1880 and look for other interesting things. Look for who could be, by ages, who could be maybe related to whom. And, and you're going to take a lot of notes in this process because it's not a basic find a record, attach it to my person, voila, I'm done. That's not going to work here. You need to be paying attention to the fan club, which is friends, associates, and neighbors and family too. Okay. So you want to be looking at all these other people that are around your person because it's going to make a difference. And I want you to do that in that 1870 census particularly. I want you to look at all of the people that were on that page and that were on preceding and subsequent pages that were African American because there's a really good chance that they were enslaved in the same place your ancestor was. And so it's really important to have those names. They're going to play in in a little bit later, okay? The other thing that you need to keep in mind in 1870 and 1880 is sometimes people of color changed their names. Initially, when they took that 1870 census, maybe they used their enslaver's name, surname. And then later on, they went, you know what? I, I don't want that. I want a different name. I don't, I don't want to carry his name on to my posterity. And so then they changed their mind or... Anyway, I've seen that happen before. That does happen. And so you want to be aware of that as well. And that can be one of the reasons sometimes where you have a hard time finding them in 1870. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute too. So once you've begun and you've gotten this family in 1870 and 1880, and you're kind of familiar with the family and the people that lived around them, I want you to start diving into the Reconstruction Era records. And the Reconstruction Era is that reconstructive period after the end of the Civil War. It goes from about 1870, or excuse me, it goes from about 1865 to about 1875, maybe a little bit later than that. And the main records that are going to be helpful for you here are Freedman records. And there's a couple of different Freedman records that are really important. And the good news is they used to be really hard to view, but there's been a concerted effort to get these records indexed and available online so that people of African American heritage can find their family in these records. Yay. Okay. So the first ones that I want to talk about are the Freedman Bureau records. At the close of the Civil War, the Freedmen's Bureau was established by the War Department on the 3rd of March in 1865. The mission of the Freedmen Bureau was to help formerly enslaved people become self-sufficient. 
but it also included records relating to lands and properties abandoned or seized during the war. So what's in there? You can find ration records, clothing requests, hospitals and refugee camps, supervising labor contracts and labor disputes between planters and freed people who had come back to work to provide for themselves. There were also records for apprenticeships and apprenticeship disputes. There were school records. There were records to legalize marriages that were entered into during the Civil War. And there were records to reunite families as well. And then finally, the Freedmen's Bureau was tasked with providing for the black soldiers groups. Now, a lot of times when the Civil War progressed into a slave area, those slaves were freed. And then many of them joined the effort and became part of the colored troops. And so the Freedmen's Bureaus was involved in their pay records, their bounty payments, and their pensions. I got to tell you, I just was doing a project for a client and discovered that one of her ancestors was in the colored troops and had a pension record. And that was really amazing. That's a really pretty cool thing. So that's something that you want to find out about your ancestors. All right. The other Freedmen's records are the Freedmen's Bank. Now, the Freedmen's Bank was actually created the same day as the Freedmen's Bureau, but with a different purpose. People that had been enslaved did not have any idea of how to handle their money, where to put it, where to keep it safe, and they needed some education on money because they hadn't really had any. And on top of it, you had these colored troops who were coming back from the war with some significant pay, and they were being scammed, and some of them were just splurging the money, and so there was an effort to create a bank and teach them to better utilize their money. Frederick Douglass actually became involved in the creation of the Freedmen's Bank as well as involved in the running of it near the end of it. And it's really sad because the bank would belly up in 1874 and a lot of the people that had deposited money lost their money or got pennies on the dollar. So it's just a terribly sad story. If you wanna know more about the Freedmen's Bank as well as the Freedmen's Bureau, check out my handout. And then there'll be links in the handout as well of places that you can go to obtain these records. The records are basically in three locations. You can find them on Ancestry.com and Ancestry charges for record searches usually for a lot of their record groups. You can build a tree on Ancestry for free, but when you start looking at the records, then they start charging you. However, these records are free all the time. So you don't need to have an Ancestry subscription to view these Freedman Bank and Freedman Bureau records. Another place where you can get a lot of these records and a lot of other information is Family Search. And I encourage you to also look at the Family Search wiki pages on African American genealogy because there's a lot more there. Again, links for all of this stuff is in the handout. And then the third site is the Smithsonian Institute. They have the Freedman records as well and they have done a separate index. You really want to check all three of those sites because they've been separately indexed and you may find on one site what you're not finding on another site. All right, so let's say that you don't know who the enslaver was because sometimes the enslaver is mentioned in these Freedmen records, by the way. So you really want, that's your next step. You really want to try to find them in those Freedmen records because that's going to be a lot faster than some of these other steps. However, let's say you're not finding them in the Freedmen's records and you don't know where to go now. Okay, so now we're going to look at that 1870 census. I want you to really look at that 1870 census and I want you to look at the white people that lived around your ancestor in 1870. And I want you to see what kind of real estate they owned, the value of their real estate and the value of their personal property. The formerly enslaved after the Civil War didn't have money to travel unless it had been assisted by the government. Most of them resided in the communities in which they were enslaved, and a lot of them ended up working for their previous enslaver, some of them residing in the former slave quarters. So you want to be looking at those white guys around them, okay, because they are your potential enslavers. Now, what do you do next? Look at those people in 1860. Now, remember, your enslaved ancestors aren't going to be there in 1860. 
but the white and possible enslavers will be. And so you want to look at them in the 1860 census records. You want to see how much real estate they owned then. You want to see how much personal property they owned. Now, these are the changes that you're going to see in these figures. In 1860, the Census Bureau defined personal property as bonds, notes, livestock, jewels, furniture, and slaves. And you're going to see in 1860, you're going to see a big number there for somebody that had a large plantation. You may see a personal property value of 20, 30, or even $40,000. That's a lot of money in 1860. And when you see a number that high, that is enslaved individuals. I've heard it said that when you see any number over $400 in the South during this time period, usually it means that that person owned enslaved individuals. And so that's something that you're looking for. That gives you a clue that this person probably owned slaves. And now you're going to be diving into their records because when you're looking for anything prior to the Civil War and you're looking for an enslaved ancestor, the records are going to be under the enslaver's name, okay? You're never or hardly ever going to find any record in the name of your ancestor because they were, and this makes me sick to say it, the property of this individual. And so you're going to find them in property types of records. And as much as it can sometimes honestly physically make me sick to read these records, it can be huge for you because it can help you find your ancestors. All right, so you're going to keep on that pattern. You're going to look at them in 1850. You're going to look at their family. You want to look at their parents and you want to look at their descendants because oftentimes property was passed amongst family or bequeathed to family in a will. So you want to know those names. You want to be building their family groups, really building their family tree. Then we start crossing off potential candidates. Now, how do we do that? This is the hard work. This is the stuff that really takes a lot of time. You're going to dive into county records in the area that they lived, and you're going to be looking at wills and probate records, and you're going to be looking at deeds first. Those are the first places that I always start. Now, let me go into a little bit more detail. And I do have videos about both of these things that spend a lot more time talking about how do you find somebody in a deed index? Every county can be different. They can be very difficult to go through. And I've seen a lot of people miss their family because they're looking in the wrong place or they think they found everything there is to find. It's really tricky. And so I have a whole separate video on how to examine deed records called Dive Into Deeds. And then I have another video on probate and will records. So Check those out because they'll give you a lot of information that I don't have time to do today. I just want to add that on deeds, a lot of times we think of deeds as records that are real estate deeds, right? That's when we think when we hear a deed, that's kind of what we think of today. And that's true. Deeds could have been real estate records, but in the South, deeds also um, transferred other types of property. And you will find in oftentimes in deed records, and it depends on the county, it depends on the state. Sometimes they have them separately. Sometimes they aren't included. There's just no straight, this is what will work. You just kind of have to dig through it and figure it out. But in deed records, you'll frequently find somebody that is selling property and that includes slaves. Okay. Now in probate and will records, some wills specifically bequeath property, including slaves, to their descendants. Um, but one of the other things that is sometimes even more valuable is in this time period when somebody passed away, their estate was inventoried and then everything was actually like resold. So the wife was rebuying her property. It was really weird. Um, anyway, but in those inventories and estate sales, sometimes the enslaved are listed by their name. So those are huge. And I've even seen them where they say that this child is the child of so-and-so. That's gold, okay? That gets you back another generation. All right, another record group that you wanna be looking at is the Southern Claims Commission. Now the Southern Claims Commission was formed to reimburse people for property that was taken from them or destroyed during the Civil War by the Union Army. Um, I have seen a property claim for a African-American formerly enslaved individual. So you can find Southern Slave Commission records in both the enslaver's name or in the enslaved's name. 
Now, why would you care about the enslaver's Southern Claims Commission records? Because sometimes the witnesses were their slaves who were then providing testimony about it. And sometimes these records mention that information or other information that can help you out in your family history search. So you wanna be looking for in the Southern Claims Commission records, both your enslaved family, as well as the possible enslavers. Then finally, I really want you to check out the WPA slave narratives. WPA is the Works Progress Administration. Um, they were done between 1936 and 1938. And the government went back and they interviewed, and there's photographs as well, people that had been formerly enslaved and asked for their life stories. Now, I do need to warn you that sometimes the information in them is not correct for a couple of reasons. One, memories often weren't great, right? This is 60 years after the end of the Civil War, more than that, 70 years after the end of the Civil War. And so the people that were speaking that had been enslaved, they, they were quite old. Um, the other thing is sometimes, you know, we tend to represent ourselves in the best light possible. So you got to kind of sometimes take some of that information with a grain of salt, but it gives you such a deep understanding of what it might have been like. And if you find your family, if you find one of your ancestors or, you know, one of your aunts or uncles, okay, you don't want to restrict this just to your direct line ancestors. You want to be looking at the whole family. You could learn a ton about your family and about their experiences in slavery. So really recommend those records. And the link to that is in my handout as well. All right, problems, okay? We're gonna run into problems. Brick walls are part of genealogy. That's what we call them, brick walls. They can be climbed over, but they do hedge up our research, okay? So what do you do when you're running into some brick walls and what are some common brick walls for people of African-American heritage? We talked before about the name changes, okay? After emancipation, a lot of people change their names. My hint for you there is I want you to do census searches by the first name of the family members. So let's say you find them in 1880, but you cannot find them in 1870, and you have scoured those census records where they lived. I want you to search by just the first names, and you might find them by their names with a different surname, okay? So that's a great way to find your family. Um, you can also go page by page in a particular record because sometimes they were indexed incorrectly. It couldn't be read. Um, another hint is to look at other census records. Like you can look at census records on Ancestry. You can look at census records on Find My Past, My Heritage, Family Search, which is free. Um, that gives you those databases sometimes have indexed them independently and you may find them in one database when you're not finding them in another. So those are my hints there. Let's say you just can't trace your family back. You can't find them in 1880. You can't find them in 1870. Sometimes that's not just an African-American issue. We all have that problem. I've had family lines that I, I can't find them in certain census records. And I have a brick wall where I can't find somebody in 1880. I, I can't find them for sure. It happens to all of us. Go back to your Genealogy 101 playlist. Take a look at that. Look for some possibilities there. Review everything. Look at all of your images. See what you might be missing. They probably relocated. Although I will say that sometimes people were missed. I've actually mapped out everybody in a census record in two different decades. And I find everybody in one census record. And then I find these street addresses missed in the other census record. It happens, okay? So, and if you can't find them in 1870, you've got to work with the 1880 information that you have. Um, but one of the things that I would recommend that you do is look at who lived by them in 1880 and then look up those people in 1870 and see if they were in the same place. Because people, especially in this time period, moved together. It was rare that somebody set off on their own. It was too hard. They needed their fan group. They needed their friends, associates, and neighbors. They needed to work together to survive. The other thing that I would recommend that you do is take a look at online forums. They can help you with some of these issues. Um, there's an African American Genealogy Facebook group, as well as a lot of other Facebook groups that may be of interest to you. There's also an Afro American Historical and Genealogical Society, as well as local chapters for that national society. Links to all of these are in the handout. You also want to obtain further education. Ari Wilkins teaches week-long seminars for the Texas Institute of Genealogical Research on African-American genealogy. Um, there's a lot of other ones out there. All of the different groups do that. IGR, SLIG, links to all of this are in the handouts, okay? 
Um, those week long, they're usually webinar format. You don't, you can go in person, but you don't have to. Those are really intense and really helpful. So I would really recommend that. And then finally, you just want to learn. You want to go to YouTube channels. You want to go to other sites where you can get content. You can go to local genealogical societies. Now with Zoom, a lot of them are broadcasting their content. So you don't even have to live in an area to look at their content. Become a member of the state genealogical society where your family had been enslaved. Become a member of the county genealogical society that you're talking about. That's really helpful to do. And then finally, my last recommendation is sometimes you kind of just put it down for a while. New records are popping all the time. Sometimes when we come back at it, we can find those new records or we're just looking at things in a new light, fresh eyes. Um, sometimes in the meantime, we're working on a different family line and we've learned a lot of information because the more genealogy we do, the more we learn. And genealogy is definitely one of those things where the more you know, the more you know you don't know. There's new stuff coming up all the time. And one person could be very aware of all of the records in North Carolina, but know nothing about the records in Georgia. And so as you're working in different locations, you're going to learn more information and you're just going to get better. And as you are better, you're going Going to have the opportunity to apply that knowledge to this old pro problem that you'd set aside for a while. I really hope this has been of help to you. I really hope that you have the courage and some of the skills now to begin your African American research. Is this everything? No, I can't put it in a video. There are all kinds of other records that you can look at, plantation records, county histories. There's just there's so many other places that you can go that you can get more information. And a lot of those are delineated in this handout. Now this is a 17 page handout. I really tried to beef it up. My YouTube videos have to be relatively short because of the platform. So I threw a bunch of stuff in this handout. So I hope it's helpful for you. Again, I hope that you can do this. Don't give up. And if you're struggling, reach out to other people that are involved in African American research and you will be able to find your family. Finding your family is such an amazing experience. Learning about the people that came before you, the people that made your life possible. And in your instance, if you do descend from enslaved ancestors, they were enslaved. They were free. They scraped and built a life after being enslaved. I have so much respect for them. You descend from those people. You want to know who they are. So good luck with that. Over here to the side is that Genealogy 101 playlist as well as another video that might be of interest to you. Please subscribe to the channel for more videos on this topic and others that may help be helpful to you. And give this video a like if it's helped you. I really do appreciate you watching. Have a great day.